So I will introduce first uh, Professor Regina Kulachan, who is the head of the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore and the Academic Strand Director of UCD Adastra Scholars. Regina has published widely on Irish language media and on the revival period, including two books as sole author and um, a co-author, she's been also a co-author in 2014 of a book uh, on Gaelic films in Catalonia. Um, Regina has also co-edited six other books. The title of her talk today is Crossing Borders, Transnationalism in Irish Language Revival and Media. Okay, thank you very much, Enrique. I'll just start immediately. And um, for my presentation today, I took the approach of using a, um, a presentation as well to supplement. So I'm going to share my screen with you and hopefully this will come up. Okay, yeah, here we are. Okay, Revival in Irish Language Media. And while this is, uh, today's talk is basically on uh, crossing borders and transnationalism in Irish language and media, this is based on a project that I had the fortunate um, opportunity to spend some time in Melbourne University last year in an archive in the Nicholas O'Donnell archive, who was one of the main uh, leaders of the Gaelic revival in Australia, believe it or not. And I'm working at the moment on a monograph on Pobal Agus Scale, which means community and story. I'm basically telling the story of the Irish without, uh, without the boundaries and maybe um, looking in the context of the perspective of networks and uh, as Rebecca referred to uh, in the context of patterns of movement uh, in uh, what these sources show. Um, I've looked at a lot of the stuff in the context of Ireland and now I am looking at the more global context and much of it I've done to date and I'm hoping that next year I will have a sabbatical uh, that uh, will uh, bring this to a conclusion. So uh, just to move to the next uh, slide. This is what you have in front of you is the um, this is the uh, editorial in the Advocate newspaper in Melbourne in March 16th, 1907. And these are some of the sources I'm looking at in the context of uh, media. So the sentiment Ireland a nation finds an echo in the hearts of the sea divided Gael. And that's very much it's still the Gael, but they are sea divided in the cradle land of this race. The Gaelic League is helping to make the sentiment a living reality. This league created a new life in Ireland and has taught the people that one of the attributes of nationality is a distinctive tongue. The revival of the Gaelic language is one of the most hopeful signs of the times. And although I Ireland is losing her population if the government honestly carries out its promise to govern Ireland according to Irish ideas and to introduce measures that will eventually concede them to make laws for themselves, emigration will cease and so forth. So they are looking on the tongue uh, that is being used here as a key also to Irish ideas where people probably can connect with these Irish ideas no matter where they are in the world. Now, as I say, this was to do with, and I'll go into the other sources in a second, but uh, this is, sorry, this happened to me yesterday as well. I don't know why it's not, uh, yeah. Um, this is to do with the Gaelic League. Uh, the Gaelic League was founded in 1893, for those of you who aren't aware, and I'm sure possibly many of you are, but it was founded to revive the Irish language. And the main two uh, aims of it are there at the top the preservation of Irish as the national language of Ireland and the extension of its use as a spoken tongue and the study and publication of existing Gaelic literature and the cultivation of a modern literature in Irish, which was key because this modern literature was really going to be uh, the, the key to engaging with other cultures and engaging with new ideas as well. So, and, and we've heard that very much in the other talks. So research questions that I'm looking at, why media and print culture? What does this mean in the context of the Gaelic revival movement? Why learn the Irish language as part of the Gaelic cultural revival? And where does the global connection fit in? Where are and what are the communities of communication is basically what I'm looking at. These are just my, I'm not going to go into these today. This is a very short presentation of what I'm doing. But to your right, you can see Nicholas O'Donnell and the Advocate newspaper, which I was looking at when I was in, news, in um, Melbourne. But the second source I was looking at was the O'Donnell archive. So these are just, this is just um, an overview of some of the sources. And basically on your, uh, if you're looking at the screen to your left, the first Irish language journal was in Belfast, Bullock and Thuller. And then there's a list of those right up until the turn of the 20th century. But the other sources that I have found and that I'm still examining uh, in the United States, Australia, UK, 
uh, Argentina, New Zealand and South Africa. These seem to be the main places to date. And just, uh, but today I'm focusing on the Australian one because it's the most recent one I've done. But to give you the background to O'Donnell and the newspaper, O'Donnell was now increasingly driven by the inspiration of the Gaelic revival and was regarded as Australia's leading Gaelic scholar, introducing or conducting a column in The Advocate with type imported from Ireland, the only Australian newspaper to do so. And just you can see how they try to. Um, uh, imitate the uh, the manuscripts with the designs that they had. This is just some examples of the, uh, the 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 imagery that was used. For example, he uses the actual script in this Irish language poem uh, from um, uh, called "Wearing the Green" or "Caihu and Glash," and he has to translate it on his own then afterwards. But the writing is from the author, who was Eugene O'Growney, one of the leading um, uh, linguists in the uh, Gaelic revival. Also then here, we just, he, he um, documents here the importation of the, uh, they have ordered and obtained a new font of Gaelic type. So not only was the language itself important, but the usage of the letters and the orthography was also very important. Um, and then another example of the Gaelic column and here where they have documented the first AGM of the Gaelic League in Melbourne in Australia in 1902, which I mean is really quite phenomenal for us looking at that as stutters, study as scholars of revival and media, because I mean, until actually even when I went to Australia, some people had been on the Nicholas O'Donnell Fellowship uh, before, but um, before I had looked at the Gaelic content in the archive and in the newspaper, people weren't really aware of the connection. So maybe it goes back to Rebecca's points on looking at the sources and how these can help us uh, in the humanities. And then again, the connections. O'Donnell had been in connection with um, Douglas Hyde, who of course was the founder of the Gaelic League in 1893, the first chair of Irish in UCD in 1909, and the first president of Ireland in, 19, in, in 1938. So I mean, it just shows that and he had all these links this and this is the archive then where he has and just to look this is kind of um important i'm, I'm nearly at the end it's not uh, too too much um but what uh, what we what we see there are books but nicholas o'donnell took each one of those texts and um he took it upon himself to bind them into eight um, seminal texts that would help anyone who was trying to learn the language and he did his own you can see in the middle there he did his own uh, table of contents and the first book he has there is the drama from Douglas Hyde one of the initial dramas of the Irish revival so he took the very very core elements of it and in that I mean he looked at for example Hyde's work on a literary history of Ireland and this is just Hyde's, Hyde's work and some of the, the sources you can see there to your left these are all from the O'Donnell archive and uh, just the quote that he is, where he has written in his marginalia, you know, this is a very tiny piece, but actually we're at the moment engaging with um, a project on marginalia for this archive with Melbourne University, because there was so much material in that that is very, very worthy of giving us further insights into the concept of these communities of communication. And finally, uh, in, he wasn't averse either to uh, criticizing the modern literature. In this, he has actually criticized one of our main writers, Padraig O'Connor, but we can see the very conservative attitude because uh, the translation is that it's um, a dirty, lustful story bringing shame on every Irish person and on the Irish language movement. So, but he has written that into the book. So it's just that, but it's, it's, it was, a very clear modern literary topic and this was you know it, it was a story about love and uh, some of the work of Padraig O'Connor was quite revolutionary in the context of the themes that he used and uh, finally then this is correspondence from Padraig O'Donnell the first person who wrote the very first uh, the first lexicographer who published the first Irish language dictionary but you can see he was in correspondence with all these and again, this is the, and to finish, this is the interesting part that not only was he in contact with him, but Padraig O'Donnell mentioned him in the book, Felina Maia in 1906. I received a letter as the pages containing Father O'Donnell's lament for his horse was passing through my hands in proof. I received a letter from Dr. Nicholas O'Donnell that distinguished Melbourne Gale seeking for information concerning his poet kinsman. Dr. O'Donnell comes of a county Limerick stock and is in all probability allied in blood to his principal. Namesake. And just finally then, 
So this was it. Why, why learn Irish? Why the transnational? And this is, you know, for example, here we have Sally Richardson, who was learning Irish, but reappraising our ideas of who we are, where we come from, doesn't have to undermine our identity. On the contrary, it can strengthen it. And even though Irish would be perceived to be a minority language. And finally, Ron McCoy, who is a, a, a singer in all languages, but when he started singing in Gaelic, the language started to become part of me in my daily life, my reading, my emails, my way of thinking. I felt connected to my past and my ancestors, and that was from living in Australia. So that um, concludes my, um, uh, my, my presentation, and I'm sorry, it was, it's, a, it's a bit condensed, but trying to maybe give you a flavor of the archive material as well as the importance of the living media material as well. Thank you, Gura Thank you very much. Um... Thank you, Regina. Um, and you kept, you kept to the time. So thank you for a very interesting talk and very timely talk. Um, I would like now to introduce Alexandra Lorenzo Diaz, who is um, a language assistant at the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics at UCD. Her main research is intersemiotic translation in contemporary Portuguese literature, such as from novel to graphic novel. And also she studies ekphrasis as a critical tool. She has a forthcoming book with Peter Lang titled A Novella Grafica Como Genero Literario. <laughs> Hopefully not to mispronounce. No. The title of her talk, I think she's going to uh, introduce, uh, um, present on Lusophone literature today. Yeah, thank you, um, <laughs> Enrica. That's very kind. Your Portuguese is excellent. Uh, I would like to apologize because the title of my presentation is actually a bit vague and it seems to be a bit inconsistent, but I had some... Uh, <laughs> troubles deciding on which way I should go in this webinar. So as you realize, I'm a little bit evolving from Portuguese visuality in literature to another field that uh, actually uh, it's a passion uh, and interests me a lot, which is the field of Lusophone literature. So um, I had three options. I had three different titles. Um, I decided then to focus on the one I'm going to share with you now. Uh, which is Lusophone literature, and I hope everybody is seeing it, uh, a transnational palimpsest. So as I said, um, I want today just briefly introduce the Lusophone literature as a field, uh, an academic field that is still a bit unknown, especially um, here in Ireland, I suppose the UK is giving it a little bit more of uh, development and uh, importance in terms of uh, research. Uh, but sometimes I feel that when I'm talking about Lusophone literature, a uh, few people know exactly what I'm talking about. So Lusophone literature is something that refers to this vast universe of countries where Portuguese uh, empire extended its colony. So it refers to Portugal, Brazil, Angola, Mozambique, Cabo Verde, Guinea-Bissau, São Tomé, Príncipe, and I would exclude Timor-Leste or East Timor because uh, it's, it's because of uh, histor historical contingencies and because it's a country has no significant literary production in Portuguese language. But I wouldn't take long to explain because it's another different uh, country context. Uh, but anyway, the question here is, uh, Lusophone, why not Portuguese literature as an Anglophone or Francophone? So the word is connected to this myth mythological um, crew, uh, god, uh, which is related to the god Bacchus, uh, and he became the, the father of the, of the Portuguese ancestors. So um, we were called the Lusitanians, and we would live in the north of Portugal. So the word was then um, immortalized by uh, our great writer Luis Camões in the epopee, the Portuguese epopee, Us uh, Lusíadas, so to refer to the Portuguese. So this word is actually connected from the very beginning with um, the mythical and as well the, the Portuguese maritime expansion. So it's a word that sometimes we had some troubles relation and also because of the Portuguese culture and because of the contingencies of colonialism in Portugal. But anyway, it came to, uh, to be widely used and it was introduced in academia 
only um, in the late 1960s. So the word Lusophone is applied to all countries where Portuguese is spoken. Uh, as I said, as a product of colonialism and as a product of Portuguese diaspora. So when we talk about Lusophone literature, of course, that we talk about this vast universe that at the same time comprehends three distinctive literary systems. And I will talk about literary systems because um, in generally and referring to three different continents. So the Portuguese literature in Europe, Brazilian literature in South America, and then the literature from African Portuguese speaking countries, which in another way has different literary systems, each one belonging to each country uh, with more significance for, I suppose, Angolan and Mozambican literature, which are the most well known and translated. So uh, Lusophone literature is actually a complex system, but it's also a diffuse and manifold network. And this brings me uh, again to the word I chose for the title of this, uh, this communication and the word uh, palimpsest, because I was, as, as I said in the beginning, a little bit uncertain. So one of the words that I came to be used to use when I think about Lusophone literature is that the idea of a, a mosaic. But now that I think about it, and especially when I read the new writers, um, I, I realize that the word doesn't fit because we actually have this network and then we have the, the different layers uh, of significance. So behind poetics and behind the literary aesthetics, what actually happened and what makes Lusophone literature so distinctive? So first of all, we had a colonial process that differ greatly from other countries countries, namely from the UK or France. So we started something um, that was actually a practicality. So when we started to do the expansion, we thought, well, let's stay here and let's miscegenate with the natives because that would facilitate the process of colonization. Also because there were some islands like Cabo Verde that were not uh, inhabitant. Uh, so we had to have people staying there and um, so we brought some, some people from Angola at that time, we're not talking especially in slaves at the time, so it became later a, a condition, but at the time we're just migrating people from one country to the other because we wanted and we needed it to be populated. So the Portuguese court, that's something special as well about Portuguese colonization process, the Portuguese court moved to Brazil during Napoleon invasions. So the empire for the first time in history was ruled from one of the colonies. So then later on and during the Portuguese dictatorship, uh, the colonies were called provinces and they were actually seen as an immigration space for unemployed Portuguese citizens as opposed to the image or the figure of the colonizer. So for most Portuguese, moving to those provinces was actually a, a work opportunity. And this was something that never happened in different colonization contexts. So there's a mobility and this is um, where trans tra transnationalism makes now a lot more sense to, to talk about when we think about literature to has a, um, a theoretical approach to it. Uh, of course, then we had also something which was really, really important in the history of Lusophone literature, which is the Portuguese language agreement. So for most of <laughs> um, who don't know what, what it is, it's just an agreement between all the Portuguese speaking countries in keeping the same language. Um, so uh, of course this is, it uncovers a, a political and a financial sort of agreement because we wanted to have more international outreach. Of course, there were as well into the editorial concerns and we wanted to make the language one of the most big or spoken languages in the world. So as you can see, the, the network uh, works here in a very complex way. 
So different layers of historical and uh, cultural contingencies converge to form a very specific grammar, uh, literary grammar, that it is defined by hybridity, by difference, and from a word that I actually underline here, which is transla translatability. And the, the image of the translator is some, it's a, Im, uh, a figure now very important in Lusophone literature, and I'll, I'll hope to have some time to talk about that as well. So, when we talk about this transnational palimpsest, so we're talking about the Portuguese nationalism or the Portuguese literature as the substract, the Brazilian tropicalism that influenced a lot of Portuguese writers as well, but also a lot of uh, uh, Mozambican and Angolan writers. And then we have on top of that, the layer of Africanity. So when I think about the Lusophone literary studies, we're actually thinking about something that is actually quite new. Uh, so in Portugal, the word Lusophone was first used in 1968, I, if I'm not wrong, and it was used to, to refer to the name of the center. So we don't use it as much as a name of an area of studies. Uh, it was actually quite recently introduced, and I suppose as a consequence of the international movements within the academia and the reception of international students who are now in, in, interested in Lusophone studies and learning Portuguese, especially students coming from uh, Asia. So it's actually a very recent uh, um, academic field, but we can recognize three uh, main periods on the theoretical approach. So we have the first one, which colonialism and where all the studies focus on the, the specifics uh, and the specific context of colonialism in Portugal uh, or the Portuguese colonialism and how that impact the different literatures that are under the umbrella of the Lusophone literature with a special um, with a special uh, focus on the romanticism, on indigenous exotism, the tropicalism, so all the beauties that we could grab, but always with the legacy of the Portuguese uh, literature behind. Then we have the, the period of differentiation where, um, where uh, the creolization started to, um, to emerge and a, a shift from the landscape, from the pol political landscape of... Uh, Sorry, I'm kind of time. time. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you like this, Alexandra, but the chat function... I know, I know, I'm so well. sorry. Yeah, I was almost... Sorry, I... But anyway, I can answer any questions later on. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. So just to flag it, unfortunately, when there is a PowerPoint on, which I explore in experience as well, uh, there is a, a difficulty with the chat function and the speakers don't receive the signal. So oh. I am going to put thumb up. Yeah, I see, I see, I saw it, but I... There is a minute left. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Alexander, for a lovely talk. Um, very interesting. Uh, uh, I learned a lot uh, from it. And I would like now to introduce... Um, Joseph Twist. Joe Twist is Assistant Professor of German Literature at the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. He researches in the intersection of philosophy, religion and literature. His latest monograph published by Camden House in 2018 is titled Mystical Islam and Cosmopolitanism in Contemporary German Literature, Openness to Alterity. The title of his talk today is Eunice Emre meets Frederick Holderlin Mysticism and Modernity in the Writing of Zafer Shenojak. Okay, uh, th thanks very much, um, Enrica. So um, today my paper will explore the topic of the, the transcultural through overlapping and, and cross-pollinating national literary canons uh, using the work of the Turkish-German writer Zafer Shenojak as an example. Um, and after deliberation, I decided to use the term transcultural, which I acknowledge isn't, isn't perfect, uh, rather than transnational, since uh, some of the sources I refer to predate the Turkish and German nation states, and they also involve religious rather than national um, categories. So it sort of links back to um, what, what Rebecca spoke about in her keynote about kind of looking backwards as well as um, at, at the contemporary situation for examples of, of things that we might describe, uh, describe as, as transnational. Um, 
Okay, so um, as the title of my paper indicates, the influence of the Turkish mystic Yunus Emre, whose, whose poetry Shena Jack has translated, and the German uh, romantic Friedrich Hölderlin will be my focus. Uh, and Shena Jack brings these two poets into dialogue in his own poetry, uh, forming part of his project to trace the roots of the Enlightenment to hopefully arrive at a different sense of Enlightenment today that is more critical and less instrumentalizing. So uh, first, Shena Jack reminds us that the Enlightenment is a transcultural project of East and West, which is especially important in the German national context, where Muslims are often shut out from a post-Enlightenment sense of modernity, and where culturally specific German values are often regarded as Enlightenment norms. And um, in that way, kind of the particular and the universal are conflated. Um, Shenajak foregrounds the role of Islamic mystics in, in particular here. I have a quote, uh, the fruits of the Enlightenment were planted and cultivated jointly in Andalusia and Spain, in Seljukian Anatolia, in the Cordoba of Avaroes, and in the Konya of the, mystical, of the mystic Jalal al-Din Rumi. Uh, and secondly, Shenajak attempts to rekindle this transcultural cooperation by creating a link between Sufi mystics and German romantics in particular in his own poetry. And for Shena Jack, Sufis and romantics share, both share a desire to challenge the scientific rationalization of nature on the one hand and the mechanical religiosity of, of organized religion on the other. And so in Shena Jack's essay entitled Yunus Emre, Our Contemporary, he encourages the reader to view Yunus Emre as a progressive figure here, partly following trends in Turkish Republican scholarship that characterize Yunus Emre as a humanist. So he refers to uh, Yunus Emre as, quote, the preacher of those values of the Islamic Enlightenment, uh, which those, the Islamic, Islamic Enlightenment have cultivated, love, tolerance, and peace. Um, and Shenajak also cites the transcultural makeup of Anatolia as important for understanding Yunus Emre's writing and his form of mysticism. Um, yes, these Turks already saw themselves as Muslim, but the culture they brought with them exhibited clear traces of pre-Islamic shamanist modes of faith. This synthesis resulted in fertile soils for many eclectic, heretical, and very tolerant religious orientations, which quickly came under a mystical umbrella. Rather than viewing Yunus Emre as a proto-secularist, Shenajak stresses the importance of the religious dimension of his thought, arguing that Islam need not secularize to become compatible with modernity, and nor should it, if it is to help challenge the limitations of a wholly secularized process of enlightenment. Thus, if Shenajak values the idea of enlightenment, he does so with some caveats. He refutes the assumption that modernization is an inherently positive force, identifying two interconnected branches within modern thought involving humanism and enlightenment on the one hand, and the absolute claim by humans to domination of nature and Europe's colonialism on the other. And although Shenajak uses enlightenment in a positive sense here, the distinction he makes resonates with Max Horkheimer and Theodor W. Adorno's argument that instances of extreme brutality, such as colonialism and the Holocaust, not only happened in spite of enlightenment, but also because of it since the concept of enlightenment is embedded in a dialectical relationship with myth. If, as these thinkers contend, the central drive of enlightenment and by extension the 18th century philosophical movement is fear of the unknown, then its mission to scientifically and rationally explain the material world can fall back into the utilitarian domination of both nature and humanity. Throughout much of his writing, Shenajak seeks to salvage the self-critical qualities of enlightenment from its instrumental aspects by rekindling its transcultural origins. He praises, for example, Yunus Emre's enlightened brand of humanism that does not result in anthropocentrism. Quote, uh, the modern understanding that science and art is to be practiced as an end in itself has raised many questions. Yunus Emre's philosophy represents a counter image to this European view. It does not link human freedom to the level of knowledge over nature, but rather to the level of knowledge over the self. Here, Shenajak makes clear that Yunus Emre's mystical outlook can act as a counterbalance to the instrumental understanding of enlightenment that currently dominates the globe. 
Shenajak laments that many Muslim countries have chosen to ignore the positive aspects of this joint enlightenment heritage, but embrace the instrumental ones, such as industrialization and military technology, albeit under threat from Western powers. Whereas various essays outline Shenajak's criticisms of contemporary Islamic thought, his attempt to create a new Islamic canon takes place in his poetic writing, which is inspired by figures such as Yunus Emra. And I've got one example poem uh, here from a cycle called Istanbul Tango, uh, from a poetry collection called um, Ritual der Jugend, Ritual of Youth, published in 1987. Um, and it's a salient example since it has the most overt associations with the Sufi tradition in perhaps all of Shenajak's poetry. Well, I'll, I'll read out my English translation. Um, as, we, as we went, the wine came. As we came, the wine went. Untouched by our timid thirst, a red veil was the wine. We two windows joined by an oriel, we architects of vice. Not much awaits us mortals. Happy are we with a little bread and wine. A lad brought the full decanter. Was he the beautiful one or was it the decanter? Later, someone else picked the decanter up, untouched by our timid thirst. Another butler laid his beguiling trace. Did he stay untouched or was it the decanter? Not much awaits us mortals. Happy are we with a little bread and wine. Um, as critic Karin Yeshalade asserts, this poem's imagery and loose gazel form indicates a clear link with Sufi poetry. The themes of wine and homosexuality signal a clear break from orthodox forms of Islam and a turn towards a Sufi understanding of divine love, as the link between drunkenness, sexual passion and spiritual ecstasy are common Sufi tropes. Here, it is through alcohol that the inhibitions of the poetic persona and the young man are overcome, and they can presumably become intimately acquainted. This imagery can function on a symbolic level, but some Sufis also consider beauty and sexual passion as providing access to the divine on a material level. And Islam's supposed incompatibility with contemporary German attitudes towards gender and sexuality, which form a prominent feature of integration debates, is, is challenged. Moreover, this poem not only suggests an Islam that dispenses with heteronormativity, but equally one without clear boundaries to other religions as the bread and wine allude to both Sufi ideas of asceticism and also the Christian Eucharist. Thus, the ambiguity of the above poem and its acceptance of heterodox Muslim identities can be regarded as a creative reinterpretation of the Anatolian mysticism of Yunus Emre's era, with its porosity of religious boundaries and its mixing of Islamic and shamanist traditions. This reference to bread and wine also brings me to Friedrich Hölderlin and the connection with his elegy um, uh, Brot und Wein, uh, Bread and Wine, published around 1800. Reading German Romantics alongside Turkish mystical poetry was an important source of inspiration for Shenajak that, quote, unleashed the very creativity in him that enabled him to write poetry. And that's something Shenajak has, has said himself. Um, and Hölderlin's spirituality, particularly his thought around the lack of divine names, resonates with Shenajak's engagement with Sufism. The dilemma surrounding the inability to express the divine in language can be seen uh, in Brot und Wein, as bread and wine symbolize a trace left behind by the absenting gods. Um, bread is the fruit of earth, yet touched by the blessing of sunlight. From the thundering gods issues the gladness of wine. Therefore, in tasting them, we think of the heavenly who once were here and shall come again, come when their advent is due. Hölderlin can therefore be linked to mystics such as Jonas Embra, who seek a personal relationship with the divine outside of institutionalized rituals that name God and presume to act on his behalf, thus minimizing his divinity. Shenajak's poem thus undermines the East-West dichotomy by demonstrating the compatibility of Jonas Embra's writing with liberal attitudes to gender and sexuality, through ambiguous allusions both to Islam and Christianity, and by conflating Turkish and German literature. Shenajak's own attempts to evoke a mystical relationship with the divine that avoids dogma and group identities has a similar paradoxical sense of the divine that is both distant and near, as we see in Hölderlin's poetry. Uh, the poem you see now from Istanbul at Tango uh, also leaves the matter of divine presence, symbolized here through erotic encounter, unanswered. 
as drunkenness not only leads to the loss of inhibitions and of rational thoughts, but also of memory, casting doubt on events. This problem, Hi, okay, this problem is em emphasized through the structure of the poem and the repetitions, which kind of suggest um, memory loss. Um, but either way, whether it was the decanter or the, or the butler or the young, the young uh, man that was untouched, a kind of orthodox interpretation of Islam has been, has been contravened. Um, so what I, what I wanted to say is that basically to try and get out of this, I, um, to try and rediscover a sense of enlightenment that isn't instrumentalizing and falls back into this trap of trying to uh, control nature and um, where knowledge leads to, leads to a sense of, um, of control and, and exploitation. Shenajak instead um, emphasizes um, a more self-critical aspect of enlightenment by focusing on um, the irrational and the unknowable and the, and the undecidable. Um, and, and he does this through um, rediscovering the, what he describes as the transcultural origins of the enlightenment and bringing um, mystical Islamic thinkers back into, into the equation. Okay, so uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, Britta, uh, Britta Young, thank you, Joseph, was a very interesting paper. I'm sure there was like a lot more to say, and I'm sorry that I had to cut it short. Um, Britta uh, Young is postdoctoral, RC postdoctoral fellow, researching on the migrant experience in contemporary German, Dutch, and Irish literature. Before the end of her postdoc, she was selected by the HEA to lead another major research project, examining the learning experience and impact of foreign languages on participants of Erasmus Plus in Ireland. This project resulted in a book, uh, impressive, available in open access and gathering very uh, important output. Her talk today um, is titled, This is Africa, the framing of the European South in Ilya Leonard Pfeiffer's CP novel, La Superba, and Tommy Hiringa's Dord van Murat Idrissi. Sorry for my pronunciation. Thank you, Enrica, and it was grand, <laughs> the Dutch pronunciation. Um, so I amended it, as you can see. Most of you are more or less aware that I'm currently working, as Enrica said, on a comparative study on contemporary migration literature. And that means literary texts that deal with the topic of migration in one way or another. I'm particularly interested in, in as Enrica said, the German, Dutch and Irish literature. But I have to say it's the English language texts from Ireland at the moment, as I'm afraid my Irish so far is not quite good enough. Um, I would like to look into that uh, at a later point, though, once I caught up on that. Um, Given its topic, transnationalism and transculturality are at the conceptual heart of the project. Specifically, the project takes a closer look at how authors from Germany, the Netherlands and Ireland aesthetically represent the increasing uh, interconnectedness of individual groups, institutions and states within a new global space where characteristics of national society are combined with emerging multi-level and multinational activities. Just think about how national discourses regarding migration are situated within broader European discourses and laws and restrictions, or indeed international ones. I'm particularly interested um, in questions of identity and belonging, and I'm planning to focus especially on the categories of time, space, and agency with language and memory um, featuring heavily within them. In the past month, as I'm just finished up the other project, I have started to look at the way Europe and the European South, or rather the Mediterranean, is being imagined as a, broader, as a border space. What does it mean to be European? Uh, where does Europe end and, say, Africa start, territorially, politically, culturally? While the same questions can be and often have been posed with regard to Europe's eastern boundaries, which seem to be decidedly less clear cut uh, due to the fact that they are land and not water based. Several novels I'm looking at at the moment um, have come to challenge the conventional European or shall I say Northern European mindscape of the Mediterranean, 
based on Johann Joachim Winkelmann's conceptualization of Greek and to a lesser extent Roman antiquity and its principle of noble simplicity and quiet grandeur, which became uh, key to European self-perception for the past centuries. Instead, these novels explore the otherness of the European South and highlight the status of the Mediterranean as a cultural contact zone where East meets West and North meets South, a cultural and migratory junction of historical significance. Um, this renewed literary interest in the Mediterranean South in terms of the European question has been furthered by the crises of the last two decades, particularly the financial crisis of 2008 and the continued migration and refugee crisis, which has, let's not forget, led to an increasing fortification of the EU's external borders. All in all, around 1,000 kilometers of walls and fences have been built in Europe since the 1990s, as the Amsterdam-based Transnational Institute notes in its 2018 report, Building Walls, with the vast majorities of these walls having only gone up in the last five years. Uh, targeting in particular southern and southern eastern migrants. And this is, of course, in addition to a heavily patrolled maritime border and the increasing externalization of borders through a strategic migration routes management, which outsources border responsibilities to third countries such as Turkey, Morocco and Mauritania, and fosters cross-national collaboration. The latter is actually quite interesting an interesting aspect, um, as such a concept blurs the conventional inside-outside distinction of the physical border and raises questions about sovereignty and territory. The blurring of the conventional inside-outside distinction is indeed uh, at the heart of Ilya Leonard Pfeiffer's 2013 grotesque city novel La Superbe, which celebrates the port city of Genoa as a cultural contact zone and migratory junction. Its Dutch narrator, a literary transposition of the author himself, relishes the city's otherness, its non-Europeanness, which is perhaps encapsulated nowhere better in the novel than in Ilya's disdain for the highly regulated, structured and boring life in his home country, which he feels is stifling his creativity as an, uh, as an author. Um, indeed, the experience of Genoa's otherness is captured by one of the locals Ilya encounters, who even goes as far as putting the city in Africa rather than Europe. And I quote, you think this is Europe because thanks to EasyJet, you can get back to your home country in an hour and a half. You're wrong. You are in Genoa. This is Africa. This world is completely alien to you, unquote. This is not only underlined, or this, this feeling is not only underlined in the description of the street life in the Via de Pre, an area abandoned by Italian residents and inhabited primarily by African migrants, but also later on in the dealings with the local businessman who dismisses the Italian rule of law and the EU's jurisdiction out of hand and marks them as a mere illusion. In the latter case, Genoa presents itself as a city where the communal attitude is permitted by streams of private life, business and politics, often conducted in the cafes and bars in the city streets and the piazze, rather than office buildings, are first and foremost a matter of private contracts and of ever-shifting favors and loyalties between people united by their place of residence. In Pfeiffer's novel, Genoa is a Mediterranean context zone between this East and West and North and South, as well as the European counter space, territorially, politically, and culturally to the narrator that challenges our notions of Europe and Europeanness. These notions are, however, also challenged in the 2017 novella The Dode von Moore de Trisi by Dutch author Tommy Wieringer, which is based on a 2004 court trial. Taking the details of the court case and the legal discourse attached to it as a starting point, Wieringer's novella transposes the rather depressing reality that every year hundreds of bodies are found alongside Spanish motorways leading to the north into the literary realm. By and large, these bodies remain unidentified, belonging to illegal immigrants who did not survive the passage. The bodies form part of a much larger story, which delineates the Mediterranean as the world's deadliest regions of, of, for migration, as I've outlined earlier. Miringa thus takes the general, the abstracts, and turns it into a per, in, it personal for his readers. However, he also embeds it into a larger cultural, national, and transnational history. The 19-year-old titular character Murat, a shy Berber boy looking to support his impoverished family financially, 
comes to die an agonizingly slow and lonely death in the boot of a, of a rented Audi Alfier while crossing the Strait of Gibraltar. While Murat's body travels on for several hundreds of kilometers before being haphazardly dumped by the two panicking protagonists, he is clearly marked as lost to the in-between when he, as the text declares, sinks to the seafloor. Geographically, spiritually, neither here nor there, but a shared space of historic significance. Indeed, Veringa's novella comes full circle, full circle with its geographic and spiritual denotation as it opens with a slog through the Mediterranean eventful history. From prehistoric times and the breaking apart of the two tectonic plates via the military conquest under Tariq ibn Ziyad that brought large parts of the Iberian Peninsula under Muslim rule to the flourishing mercantile networks of the 16th and 17th century that connected Europe, Africa, and the Middle East and the Black Sea region. The warfare of the Second World War and the commercial cruise ships of late. While there's certainly much more to say about the novella, let me just add this. Miringa's Murat Idrisi explores not only the Mediterranean and the fate of those desperate enough to embark on the dangerous journey to cross it illegally, but also the experience of two Dutch girls of Moroccan descent, daughters of so-called guest workers from the 70s and 80s, who are the novella's actual protagonists and focus point. While not migrating themselves, their lives are deeply affected by it both through the ancestry and the fateful adventure in Morocco. As the reader comes to learn, Turaya and Ilham feel alien in both ne the Netherlands and Morocco, not only due to the diverging gender expectations, but also due to the many mental, social, linguistic, and procedural boundaries they as second generation migrants encounter, particularly following the events of 9-11, as Turaya observes at one point. In doing so, the novella by far transcends the court case it is based on and ties into and intervenes with the renegotiation of Dutch identity and the idea of tolerance that follows the assassinations of right-wing populist Boom Fertuin and filmmaker Theo van Gogh in the early 2000s, culminating in a more stringent immigration control proposed by and introduced under Minister Rita Verdonk and the electoral success of populist Red Wilde, Wilders uh, Party for Freedom in the 2017 general election. And I think I leave it at this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry, Britta, I, I, you, know, you have, can have another minute if you want to. No, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you so much for again, another insightful paper. Um, I would like uh, to mention that Re Regina, um, uh, we'll have to go in 10 minutes. So like if there is any questions for Regina, that there are burning questions, you know, we better ask them immediately. And I have a question immediately from Joe. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself, Joe. Yeah, uh, hi, thank, thanks for your paper, um, Regina. I just have a quick question. I wondered if there's kind of a tension or a paradox in, in your paper, as it seems like kind of, it's sort of, it's the transnational and you, but it's in service of, the national in service of kind of the idea of of a nation so I wonder if you maybe you could talk a bit about about that kind of tension or, or paradox yeah uh, and tension may be the exact word Joseph I think that's a very very good point um, it's something actually in the context of maybe dealing with a minority language and a minority you know a, a, a culture in that way that might have um, evolved through a revival movement but in fact the transnational comes in and that's where I've looked in it because my work is a lot in media sources and in literature and through that I was finding more and more that there very much was a crossover between uh, the cultures that um, where, where people had migrated to and as we know you know the, the Irish have migrated to and emigrated to so many places all over the world that this was uh, actually I had this monograph almost ready to send off about two three years ago and I realized then with different fellowships that I had done in Canada and Australia and work with you know, di different places and, and really all over the world I realized that there were pockets of this in different um, in different parts of the world which needed to be exposed because it's about the people who are in um, the, the, the Irish who are in these places and how they have been subsumed into the cultures. So in fact, they're Irish, but they're very Australian. And it's trying to get the understanding of how that, um, how that network and how that movement, if you like, um, has uh, helped us to understand each other across culture. 
and uh, that, that's I suppose really where that is coming from and I mean I'm, I'm in the process of writing this up Joseph so there's a lot of theory there that I'm dealing with that I, I haven't been able to I mean I did, literally just today was dealing with just showing you what's in Australia I suppose but the other thing is that maybe just until I went to these places which I think is so it's so maybe difficult for us at the moment with COVID I learned so much by traveling there and by engaging with the people who were there, not only the people who had emigrated from Ireland, but the people, the, the Australians there who are engaging on a different level on understanding Irish culture. So it lends to mutual understandings. Um, thank you, Regina. I think that was a, a very interesting and, and uh, detailed question. And uh, I, I think Anne has a, a question for you. Sorry, I meant to answer, but I'll ask a question for yeah, you. Or yeah, right. I want to ask a question to uh, Regina because she has to go. Uh, and, and I suppose I was struck by, by, this, um, by the relationship of the center to the periphery. And it seems to me that in the examples that you've provided, the, the periphery, i.e. the diasporic uh, Irish in, in Australia, are trying to create what I would call an authenticity effect yeah, in their in their typescript, the, the way they they use Irish-looking uh, types and and insignia and the shamrock and all of that, but I think it builds on 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 um, what Joe has said. It seems to me that in so doing, they try to be more Irish than the Irish back home, i.e., defend or articulate maybe to be more positive about it, articulate a very strong sense of. Irish nationality, Irish identity in a transnational context. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, 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 that is true to some extent, Anne, but I think, um, and, and I, I, I do understand what you're saying, but I think actually what, what, what I have found is that despite that effort maybe to do that, uh, they are actually, the reverse is happening because they are actually, they, they are very much a part of the space they are occupying in in the world in a global context as opposed to and i wonder you know it's that whole thing of you know the movement of revival in some ways as opposed to just the language and the culture and that's the thing maybe for me that i'm finding you know where has you know th that this was the irish ideas and whatever but in that way that it was they they have they have learned that they've had to embrace the other ideas and I think there always will be a bit of protecting your own identity within, but this is something, the work that I've done in the States, for example, with Welsh newspapers and with Scots Gaelic uh, as well, and it is in the context of minority, but they have said that really the, the, the newspaper and that was providing that uh, commentary for them uh, to create not only a network, but um, to, to link with where they were and to link, as for example, most of their comments were, you know, Halas Awas was the title, which meant here and there. They didn't see themselves here and they didn't see themselves there. So it was a bit going back to the nomadic, uh, with, you know, what, what you know, uh, Enrica was saying, where are they? So it, that's the stuff I'm exploring at the moment. So I'm, that's what I was saying. I mean, the first papers this morning were hugely helpful for me uh, in, in, in what I'm doing at the, mo at the moment. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, Anne, but you know it's still exploration work. So, yeah. Thank you, Regina. That was uh, very ticklish, and uh, I think we have other questions. Um, and we have a question from Bettina. I would like to um, uh, ask solicit questions for also for the other uh, interesting uh, contributions to our panel. Uh, so, to Joe, uh, Britta, and Alexandra. Uh, I don't know if Bettina has a question for them. No, I, I actually also have a question for Regina, and the, the, the interest here is really because I'm, I'm dealing with a transnational community as well that has become quite transnational, and um, one of the things I find very interesting is to look at them from different layers, right? So when you look at what they're saying about the community, they always assert a very strong community effect. We're a group of people, we, we have to stick together. But when I look at their language practices, which as a linguist I like to look at, um, I find that they have a lot of transnational aspects. So people will, or, uh, will be mixing with other languages. So they will be mixing with um, French or Dutch, and there will also be a little bit of English in there in a particular way, not that it is rampant throughout, but in a particular way in order to basically verbally make that transnationalism. But on the actual um, 
discourse level about the community, they don't do that. They always do we as the community stick together. And um, then I've been recently, um, probably because of COVID, following um, um, a YouTube show that one of them is doing for other people. And I found that similar to what you were saying, that um, in the writing you find old Irish script and so on, that you find certain kinds of old traditional symbols coming up. But then the topics aren't really that traditional. And so my, my view, my, my question would be, would it make sense to try and go at the same topic from lots of different layers? Like, what are they saying? What are they actually doing language wise? And how are they producing to themselves and the rest of the world? Um, and then see what comes out because most likely, as I noticed, it's very, it's not the same. It's not homogenous. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree, Bettina. And I think some of it is going back to what Anne said there about the authenticity, that that is the first step, perhaps. But then there is the communities of communication that where they are. And I mean, maybe this is more prevalent in some of the other work that I've done with South Africa at the moment with our Global Irish Diaspora Congress. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we can really see there where the African side is much more prevalent than the Irish side, but there, there's, there's a very, very real uh, aspect of trans, transnationalism there, uh, yeah. but coming from the, the grassroots in the African um, yeah. community rather than in the Irish community. And for me, I suppose for me just this, I mean, I've dealt with Irish language, I speak through Irish language every day and whatever, and this has just opened so many more doors, I think, for a, a, an, an island that can be quite, uh, narrow and focus sometimes and I think um, you know the media the sources are language languages all over the world I, I think they, they they are revealing so much uh, in this context so yeah I think your point Bettina that's a very good approach and I might talk to you about that yeah. again that's okay true. thank you Regina and thank you Bettina for the questions now uh, uh, we have um, a couple of questions uh, we have questions from uh, Brita and Alexandra at Athet the question for Brita first um, well, okay, there's one question from Roman uh, that asks, um, does Pfeiffer fall in the trap of Orientalism? And there's also another question for Britta, if you can take two. Um, you, mentioned about the self, you mentioned about the self-perception <coughs> as your research question. Would the focus on the transnationalism shape the established understanding of self-perception in literature studies and how? Oh, all right, um, I, I give it a go. Let's see. Um, okay, first, uh, Anna's question about Orientalism. Um, Pfeiffer's novel is quite interesting in, I would say, to a certain extent, he does fall into the trap. I mean, he, he writes it, he shapes Italy in Genoa, the city, as a counter space to the Netherlands, to, to where everything is quite ordered. And it's, it's, it's really this kind of thing. So um, yes, everything there is quite exotic and quite uh, quite going there. But at the same time, he he the, the thing about Pfeiffer's novel is that he um, and that's he, Pfeiffer as an uh, author is quite a provocateur. He th he throws all the migrants into into the same pot, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you are basically an illegal immigrant or a refugee or whether you're an expat or just a European citizen using your freedom of movement. Um, like, uh, he, he boils it down to all the base kind of uh, feelings and desires, so to say. So it's, it's, it's less like ethnical and, and racially kind of connotated than it, than it would be. But then you, can, then you can see if he goes to this specific area where the Via de Pre I mentioned, this area where, where prim primarily African migrants, he takes that as, as some sort of this is the other within the other. It's like, it's even pushing it further. So I would say to a certain extent, he, he negotiates it. So there are different discourses. I'm not quite at the end of this whole analysis. So I'm still going there. So, uh, and then the other one, another question disappeared. Um, well, I'm, again, this is something I just really started to think about in the past month, ever since I finished the other thing with the European kind of thing, uh, um, uh, question. And I would, I, would, I would say it does change, or uh, transnationalism, or thinking transnationally, does change and affect it. I'm just not at the end of thinking about it yet. You um, have to come back to me like 
in a few months time and I can give another paper for Anna in the lunchtime presentation series about that if I find something there that helps. Everyone I'm sure would love, would love to, to hear that. So uh, we are, uh, we are uh, at another question from Alexandra, uh, from Diana. Yeah, it was just because she started talking about this idea of the concept of the uh, palincest in the Lucifer world. And uh, it just uh, reminded me that the palincest is a concept that is often used as a theoretical concept for Latin American studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often it clashes with the idea of the colonial heritage and the way in which the different uh, level uh, in, uh, in this kind of palincest actually relate to each other and what are the power dynamics between the different strata. So this kind of superposition, one on top of the other, the, the, in theory, the top one is always trying to delete or crush the bottom one, but there is some resistance there. I'm much more familiar with this uh, model in the Spanish-speaking Latin American context, but I'm not that familiar with how that works in the Lucifer one. So that's, that was the question, and see if there are parallelism. Well, there can be a parallelism, of course, and we can compare, but you know, I would also like to note the differences. So when we think about Portugal, comparing with Spain, Portugal is just a very small country, so we didn't have enough men. So to, to basically um, define the, the relation, uh, the power relations, I would just focus on a triangle between sex, politics, and money, because that's what, what uh, it was all about. So we didn't have enough men men to colonize and later on we didn't have enough men to fight against the, the different wars of independence. So we need to use all that we had in terms of uh, polit political influence to, to stick to our power over the, the col the, our colonies, uh, but then we realized that we couldn't do it um, uh, in a more violent way or doing it through, through war. So we need to, to, to exert our power in a, a very di different way. So the way we actually found that it was the most efficient was actually through the creation of the mulatto, through the miscegenation. So we had a lot of people marrying. Uh, and again, it was uh, uh, in terms of gender, something very interesting because a man could marry whatever black woman he could and he wanted, but a, 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 a white woman would be restricted to this sort of uh, romantic relationship. So there's a very interesting uh, topics here that we could explore and they were different. So just to say, so Portugal had uh, uh, struggled all during all this period of colonization to keep the empire together and it started to collapse with the, the independence of Brazil, of course. So later on, one of the strategies from Salazar, which was our dictator, was transforming the colonies into uh, pro provinces. And the idea was to, to provide the Portuguese people with this uh, beautiful and um, paradise uh, the space where people who were suffering from unemployment could actually move. So with again was a, 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 um, a, um, a relationship, a power relationship based on work and based on money, but based as well on um, what is the word, symbiotic relationship rather than an imposition. So later on, within the independence and the, the, the wars of independence and starting to clash, uh, and with the diamonds and the oil, we actually have two friends from Russia and then from the United States. And during the Cold War, they were actually the, the puppets of those two strong uh, uh, f political friends who were exploring diamonds and using them to, uh, to feed the war. So Portugal had no power whatsoever. Uh, and so we had to, um, to end the war, to just leave them and to uh, realize that we missed and we, it was a failure. But the mo movement now, it's again proving that the need of Portuguese presence is again needed over there. So I would say the power is now more based on the intellectual, on the academic and all the people that they need to have um, to structure the country because the, they realize the failure of the trying to uh, impose democracy and they have a hard time uh, with the, with 
uh, dealing with democracy and they have a lot of coups. Uh, uh, so the political, the politics of the country have been very unstable. And I'm, here I'm talking especially about Angola and Mozambique. So the two countries, the main protagonists uh, of all this. But again, so I suppose that the power that Portugal has. Uh, Sorry, Alexander, to cut across. Okay, so it's just <laughs> providing with people and with the know-how to help out to rebuild the countries after the war. So we still have this symbiotic relationship, I would say. Thank, thank you, um, I'm sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Alexander. That was very, very interesting. Um, I have um, another question or two questions uh, for Joe. Uh, I had one myself. Um, I, I resonated very much at all with me because of the intersection between uh, gender and religion uh, and the sub 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 uh, sub sub subversive idea of modernity in Paolo Pasolini. So, uh, but I think we'll leave this for another time. I think that there's like very oh, many overlapping between Pasolini and Shenajak. But um, I would like to, uh, there's a question from Anne. Uh, how the Lynn poetry is heavily invested in Greek mythology and the idea that Greece is the cradle of European culture. How does Shenajak deal with this? I hope you're uh, always there. Uh, no, yeah, I've unmuted myself, so hopefully you can all you can all hear me. Um, I think um, it's quite interesting. A few of the authors that I I work on um, who engage a lot with Islamic mysticism actually refer to um, Hildelin, and they do it in a way I think that um, it reminds me. Uh, it, it kind of put, reverses the the power dynamic in a way. So rather than having um, Hildelin and Germany and this European idea as to the link to to Greece and Western civilization rather than having that as the as the center they sort of shift the perspective towards the the Islamic world the Muslim world and um, and kind of show how Muslims were were also doing this and it's and they make the point as well how Greek philosophy that we know today has come to us via Arabic translations and Arabic commentaries and that kind of thing. So they um, they they show the complexity behind it and and challenge this idea that everything in the West came from this one center in in Greece. And um, I've even heard um, Hölderlin referred to as as the Sufi of of German literature. So they sort of um, provincialize Europe in that way and sort of shift the, the perspective um, towards, towards the East. Uh, thank you for uh, your answer. And I think we have another question for you, Joe, uh, from Rebecca Brown. I'm wondering whether Shana Jack has made transnationalism his thing because he gets put in that box by others. Um, I think that's that's a really interesting question, and it's sort of be, before before he kind of got attention from um, academics and that kind of thing. Who who in Germany he's kind of often viewed as as intercultural or, or transcultural, whereas in the Anglosphere he's um, people don't tend to use these um, these methodologies. He's more maybe kind of cosmopolitan or hybrid and more kind of um, theories from, from post-colonialism come into play. But it, it kind of was always there from the beginning. So when he was unknown and uh, one, one thing that strikes me is that it's, so, it, I think it often depends on which publisher he's publishing with. So he very often um, publishes with a very small publisher in Berlin, Babel Verlag and um but now he's kind of got a bit more famous um still most people in germany don't know who he is but <laughs> now he's got kind of a bit more famous um he's working with other publishing houses and you can see how um the, i think it's called the i've forgotten the name kerber stiftung um and when he publishes with them that's usually kind of essays rather than poetry you can see how the dominant paradigms in, in Germany, like um, interculturalism, like um, uh, 
the idea that kind of Germany has this neutral uh, constitution that's the bedrock of a multicultural society and that kind of thing. Uh, you can see he sort of engages more with those ideas that are a bit more established, whereas in when he's publishing with Babel Verlag, I think he's a bit more uh, radical and in when he's talk in terms of the transnational kind of when he's with the in 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 some publications he he emphasizes as I say kind of the unknown and what we don't know and the irrational um but then when he's publishing in the Kerber Stiftung his his sense of transnationalism is more about kind of understanding and getting understanding between different cultures which is more kind of the traditional way that it's discussed in uh, in Germany in terms of interculturalism so I think um I think you'd, I think you're right and they definitely kind of he's and that's often the sort of way the, the these authors who are from minorities work they sort of have a niche that they get put into and they realize it's it's profitable but I think as well um it depends on it depends on the publishing house, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that fully answered Rebecca's question. I can see she's smiling and very satisfied. Um, definitely uh, an interesting topics that emerged uh, in the session this morning. We, we have definitely gone uh, well over time with a very rich and interesting discussion. Uh, but um, we are wrapping it up now and uh, I'm sure everyone will be very happy to uh, get off the screen and go uh, for their lunches and we'll see you all today at two.